people who are on uh, Zoom. So Owen um, was an undergrad at Yale, and correct me if I'm wrong, you fell under the influence of Bus there, right? That's right. Yeah, and who's studied, so Leo Bus has studied a lot of these kinds of issues, not specifically kin selection, but the idea of individuality. And then Owen went to, um, to Rice, and where he got his PhD with John Strausman and David Quellar. And he's been an associate, a uh, research associate here for a bit. And he's gonna chat, he's gonna tell us about his views of kin recognition, and specifically this time, the kin recognition and brainless animals. But that title, reminded me of, uh, in 1970, E.O. Wilson published his Sociobiology in 1975. And a few years after that, this very well-known uh, and, and frankly uninformed cultural anthropologist, Martin Solins, wrote a book called The Uses and Abuses of Biology, specifically an attack on sociobiology. And if my memory is correct, he mocked the whole idea of kin selection and animals being important because he said animals didn't have the, uh, the neural capacity to calculate degrees of relatedness between themselves and other individuals. And just show, I mean, that's just such an absolutely ridiculous statement, but unfortunately, uh, in a lot of cases of cultural anthropologists criticizing biology, and that is a, a kind of a cottage industry. What they usually do uh, is reveal total ignorance of what they're talking about in the, in the biological system. So what, what we're gonna hear now is uh, not whether animals have enough brains uh, to be involved in kin recognition, but in a sense, do you really need a brain? Thanks, Mike. So I would just add to that, the even if you knew how to calculate degrees of relatedness, you would still need to know why it's important. So I want to use the phrase. So there's a couple of problems there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but of course, the thing is, <laughs> organisms, of course, aren't doing these calculations, but their genes evolve in a way that they behave as if they can calculate uh, degrees of relatedness or uh, why that's important. Okay, so I will talk about brainless organisms because that's where uh, I've been inspired to do some models that reveal some insights about why kin recognition evolves. But I will talk about brain organisms also. Can the people on Zoom see you when you're walking up there? No. no. Two. I'm going to try to answer these three questions. What is kin recognition? How is kin recognition used? And then what can we learn about it from brainless organisms? What is kin recognition? Okay, so I define it as the perception of variable cues that correlate with relatedness. So there's two components, perception and the cues. And the cue is the thing that you're looking at to discriminate. And it could be, we'll get into what it could be, but it could be like a spatial location. It could be a phenotype of an organism that's environmentally or genetically determined. But let's unpack this a little bit. First, relatedness. What is relatedness? Okay, so I define relatedness a little bit differently than people do in social evolution in general, but we'll get into that in a second. So if you just go on 23andMe and you, you get your DNA tested and you look at your close relatives, what it shows you is how much of your genome you share with those individuals, right? So like I, share about half with my mom and dad, uh, my cousin's about eight, and then my, my aunt is a quarter, uh, just about. So it's, it's not exactly perfect because it's a little bit random exactly what you get, but it's about on average you know, for cousins, an eight, and then half siblings, uncles, aunts, a quarter, parents, full siblings, a half, and then a clone would be one, and in general, the most important cases uh, of relatedness in nature are one half or above. So that's because a lot of organisms are sexually re reproducing and they form kin families with siblings and parents. And that's also uh, where 
because it's higher belatedness, it's also more important for evolution. So why is it important? Relatedness is important for the evolution of any behavior or trait that requires local high frequency to invade or be evolutionarily stable. And so we hear a lot about altruism, and that's one such behavior. But I'll get into some other kind of behaviors that are also important uh, in a second. Okay, invade and evolutionarily stable, what does that mean? Okay, well first, we're gonna take a single gene perspective on relatedness here. And this is the, the definition you typically hear from sexual evolutionists, which is that relatedness is the probability of a random uh, that you share an allele that's due to recent common ancestry. And it's a, I'll, get, I'll explain this in a second. And so, <clears throat> these graphs are, were first drawn by you know, similar kind of uh, graphs were drawn by graphing, but look at R equals 0 0.5 here first. So this, we're thinking about an allele that's invading a population. Uh, mu pop is the population average frequency of the allele. When it's rare, the population frequency is around zero. And then if you have relatedness of 0.5, then your local frequency of that allele is 0.5. So among your siblings, you have a half chance of sharing a rare allele. If you're a clone, you have this rare allele and you just inherited it from your recent clonal ancestor, you're gonna share it with all your clone mates. And so relatedness has the biggest impact on allele frequency when the allele is rare. Okay, as the allele then spreads, what relatedness does is it increases your chance of sharing it above the population average. So the overall effect is less. Now when the, when the allele is already, uh, when it's all the way fixed, then relatedness doesn't do anything because you share it with all members of the species. But here it does something else, which is it affects evolutionary stability. So when you're at a frequency of one of that allele, that means an alternative allele is at a frequency of zero. Now when you're testing for stability, you're asking, how does this allele do against a, an invader, so an alternative that's maybe rising to initial frequency through drift, and now you've got a situation where you might have a cheating allele against an altruist allele. What relatedness does in this situation is it increases that local uh, allele frequency in a way that can prevent the, the spread of a, a kind of, uh, an allele that would require that's positive frequency dependent, meaning as it becomes more common, it does better. And so if you're thinking about like a cheating allele, for example, um, the over here, like just the situation of a, a clonality, if, you, if you're uh, related, like your local frequency, you're not gonna have that allele among your, your group mates. And so that means you, you can avoid the cheater. Whereas everybody else in the population, I mean, the average population frequency, uh, you know, might be at 20%, but if there's relatedness, um, the cheater is in just with itself. So it's only cheating itself and it's not cheating the altruist. So the cheaters are also in a, a local, uh, they're in a situation where, where they're with themselves. So that's why relatedness is important for, from a single gene perspective, but then also relatedness increases not just the probability of sharing one gene, but the probability of sharing all your genes in the genome. And that's important because if you share one variable allele at one locus, it means you're more likely to share other variable loci at other at other loci, and also if you can infer that you're a genetic relative by matching an environmental phenotype or a spatial location where you were born or whatnot, then you have information about all the alleles in your genome, and that can be important for more complex forms of behavior, which I'll get into in a minute. Okay, so we're back to the definition of kin recognition. Okay, we know what relatedness is now, why it's important, What about perception and cues? So this is the biggest body of research in kin recognition, which is looking at the mechanisms of 
how individuals perceive and what cues they use. And there's this whole live literature on phenotype matching. And it turns out cues can be auditory, olfactory, visual in animals. Uh, they can be spatial locations. They can be context dependent. And typically individual animals learn the cues from the, like during development from their close relatives. Uh, like if they're growing up in a nest, they'll, they'll smell their nest mates or imprint, you know, understand their physical uh, characteristics so they can recognize them. And uh, there's very little evidence of the totally innate uh, ability to discriminate variable cues. It's, it's usually learned. And so auditory cues are one example where you have um, like a Mexican free-tailed free bats that live under the Congress Bridge here. There will be a million or two million bats all under this bridge. And how does the mom find her babies, her particular offspring? Well, the mother comes in and uh, she comes to the kind of the general location where the babies are, and then she starts making a call. That call is variable, as shown here. And then the, the chicks attract to her so she can find them. And then a similar thing happens in bank swallows where the chicks make a variable call. Uh, wolves have different sorts of howls that they make that are specific to the pack. Now this is one of my favorite examples of a, a variable cue. It's uh, from an American coot. And here you can actually see the variation in the eggshell. And um, what the mothers can do here is they look at their own eggs they learn what their own eggs look like, and then they're able to discriminate the, uh, the parasitic eggs, which are from individuals of the same species where they come and dump eggs in the other's nest. Yeah. In humans, the uh, face is a highly variable characteristic that can be used for, uh, I mean, humans can determine relationships based on looking at people's faces, whether they're related to themselves. And typically, they can look and see, okay, are those two people related or not, based on similarity. Here's me and my bat here. You can probably tell that we're related. And uh, it's interesting that face is so variable in humans. Uh, it could be something that was selected through, uh, for, for avo uh, avoiding interactions with non-relatives. Uh, some people, like Sheehan and Nachman, think that it might have been for individual recognition, which is an alternative hypothesis. There might be ways, ways to distinguish those ideas. Finally, another example of cues are spatial locations, so fire ants use locations of the nest for brood rating uh, at times of year before the nest mate recognition systems are functional. And then they also, once Develop when the, when the colony is developed, they, they learn a, a, a blended of odor from their colony mates, and that can allow a uh, distinction of different nests. Of course, it depends on the social organization. At the cell level, you have a similar type of situation. Instead of Q template, it's receptor ligand. Uh, like the Q, a ligand may be learned during development which uh, seems a little bit unusual, but it actually happens in uh, natural killer cell education. And it's hypothesized that a similar kind of learning mechanism operates in some organisms with, with kin recognition, like the Choloidocidians. And there is evidence that the receptors and ligands are sometimes genetically linked, and uh, that the ability to discriminate is innate, so you don't have to learn your cue, you're actually matched up uh, genetically with a matching cue, uh, a matching ligand and receptor. And that can allow for a certain amount of variability. Natural killer cell education, I'm, I'm not going to go through the details here, but just point out the, the important feature, which is that it depends on recognizing major histic compatibility in class one. Now, the problem is that this is a highly variable locus. So the cells have to become acquainted with their own allele at that locus during development. So what our bodies do is we have all these variable natural killer cells 
And then the only ones that get licensed to kill are the ones that, that match the self MHC. And the other ones are in, uh, just inert. So the ones that are able to match the self MHC over here, um, if they come up to a cell that's expressing MHC, they're inhibited from killing it. Their default is to kill, even self cells. So that's how you get auto immunity and things like that sometimes. But it will come up to the cell, look for the MHC. If it sees it, then it doesn't kill it. If, it. if it's gone, then it goes ahead and kills the self cell. And the reason it does this is that when a cell is infected with viruses or it's a tumor cell, it often loses that, those cell surface proteins. And so that allows it to kill off uh, viruses and tumors. And basically, I uh, use a similar model of just thinking about how you would have the ability to recognize a variable Q uh, in a model of cell level recognition, where basically you, you develop your ability to sense the inhibitory variable locus uh, ligand, which basically will, will prevent you from doing something that's a default rejection reaction. So the reason this is important, the education is important or learning, is that otherwise you have to have these matched genes that not only are matched like a super gene, but they're also highly variable. Uh, that's very difficult to achieve. It actually places a constraint on how much polymorphism you can evolve at that locus. Whereas if, you're only, if you only have one locus that's learned, it could have an indefinite amount of polymorphism because it's not having to like match with another one uh, ge genetically. And that, the reason that's important is because these loci are extremely polymorphic, like hundreds of alleles. Okay. Finally, variable cues. Why, why does skin recognition depend on variable cues that correlate with relatedness? Okay, so you've probably heard about a green beer gene at some point, and that's thinking about a some gene that you is it allows you to detect it in another individual and behave accordingly. Um, but it doesn't necessarily indicate genome-wide relatedness. So this non-variable genetic cue, in the first instance, is, is a similar idea. But what that does is it gives you relatedness at that locus, but not across the genome. Whereas if you rely on a hyper-variable cue, like a blended colony of odor that's going to be different for every ant colony, or a spatial location where you know where your nest is and that's different than, than that location or an extremely polymorphic gene, and at those locations you have kin groups, then what that does is it means if you discriminate based on that, that cue, then you're restricting your associations to the class of relative that it is. And that, that provides a blanket genome-wide relatedness across all loci, not just one micro. So that's why variability is important. Okay, how is kin recognition used? I basically identified three ways. Okay, you've got mate choice. Uh, that's, you know, plants do this, fungi do it, and typically those systems are, are avoiding incest. And, and the reason you do that is that, in the short term at least, inbreeding is usually harmful. Uh, it exposes deleterious recessive mutations. That can lead to a host of problems. Darwin hadn't yet run his experiments on plants when he decided to marry his cousin, but most, most organisms, including plants and fungi, and other protozoans, know not to uh, mate with their close relatives. So, um, okay, so outside of this, uh, what, outside of mate choice, you got non-mate choice. So what people typically talk about here is discriminatory altruism. And then they, often confuse that with association preference, but I, I split up these terms. Okay, what is kind of a general way of looking at this? Differential treatment and association preference. Differential treatment is just how do you treat other people or individuals, like do you help them or do you harm them? 
association preference is whether you enter the context for an interaction. So it's not, not whether you help or harm somebody, but just are you close to them enough, you know, close enough or in the context where you could actually have a social interaction. So you can choose how you treat people and you can choose whether you associate with them at all. Those are different sorts of decisions. I'm gonna focus here on discriminatory harm. So an example of discriminatory harm is aggression and sea anemones, and I'm gonna play this little video here. Uh, th these sea anemones uh, fight with each other, and they form these hyperagi tentacles by which they sting each other. And sea anemones are nightarians, so they have nematocysts, and this video will, will show this. Is a veritable silo of warheads loaded with toxins. But in order to deploy its weapons, each combatant must reach out and strike its enemy. And the fight begins. In slow motion, they deliver their devastating. associate preferentially and also discriminate um, like chase and bite non-relatives. I also think they might possibly do some form of cannibalism. I, I caught a brown trout with another brown trout in its stomach. I thought it was pregnant at first, but uh, it sounds like they might do the same stuff. And then nest robbery or usurping by queens. Um, if you Preferentially, you serve nests that are far from your own nest. Yeah, if your nest gets knocked off by a raccoon or something, and what are you going to do if you're a queen? Well, you might go knock somebody off their own nest and, and, and steal it, and you know, fly a distance away so you make sure it's not a relative, so you can use location to kind of uh, discriminate against uh, non-relatives. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about discriminatory health, um, although that's also an important factor, but uh, I'm just going to go on to association preference. Okay, so sea anemones will form these boundaries of clones, and basically they then don't fight because they're segregated. Uh, a lot of vertebrates associate preferentially with kin, like tadpoles prefer their own siblings, uh, a lot of rodents like building ground squirrels, house mice, a lot of fish associate preferentially with kin, and pretty, pretty much most group living vertebrates you, you can think of will, will prefer to associate with kin in their groups. Um, and social insects, if the nestmate recognition system is lost, as happens in invasive ants sometimes. Typically, relatedness within the nest drops to zero, which uh, shows the importance of nestmate recognition for maintaining uh, relatedness within the nest. And this is important for a highly mobile organism. Like, you know, if you have these wasps or ants, they can fly around and move around. If you don't have nestmate recognition, they can just mix, mix up and everybody's hanging out together. Why does kin recognition evolve? Okay, this is what I think we can learn from brainless organisms. And uh, go through some of what these uh, more slimy creatures look like. Okay, so an association in a plasmodial slime mold. It's basically when you when you come into the context for an interaction. Now here you're looking at two separate species of slime molds and, and they just kind of don't pay attention to each other, which is a common occurrence in 
marine invertebrates and most, most organisms that have these fusion compatibility systems, if they run into another species, they, they just, they don't really do anything. They, they just don't fuse with it and they move on. Uh, but when, if it's the same species, there's typically several things that can happen. Either they fuse and, or they reject, and if they fuse, then several things can happen. But if it's with a non-relative, often the result is fighting. And this shows a slime mold that fuses with the non-relative and then one kills the other one. And then rejection uh, prevents fusion. And, and fungi, uh, this is an ascomycete fungus, fusion with a relative, uh, it's usually fine, the same clone, it, the mycelia grows normally, but if it fuses with a non-relative, there's usually a, an odd morphology or it doesn't grow as fast or it just dies. And then rejection, uh, mycelial compatibility prevents fusion. So Vitrillus is an organism that I've been interested in because of the uh, amount of data on it, but I'm just gonna play this video so we can see what it is. It's, it's basically a, uh, a cordy. It's our closest non vertebrate relative, the tunicates are. So it's part of that class. Here you can see the blood moving between the colonies, and then the, the dark point is the rejection. So you can see like the reject, uh, I'll just back up. So here, like this whole colony, this is the boundary. And so they're not fused at this point. And this dark area is indicative of rejection. And that's where they've had an immunological uh, like hemorrhaging area where they basically like cut off connections. Now the the histocompatibility factor in Petrolis is highly variable. In one study, they found that off the coast of Israel, in an area the size of a football field, there was 300 alleles. And uh, that, that's amazingly variable. Hydroactinia is another organism that does this sort of fusion rejection response. So here is a colony that reject, uh, two colonies that reject, that's the boundary. Here's two that fuse. And this is, this is determined by two linked genes. And basically uh, the way it works is that if you, if you differ at both genes, this colony one, colony two, then you reject. If you, uh, if you share both genes, you fuse. If you share one allele of both genes, you fuse. If you share one allele of just one locus, and, you, and uh, sorry, if you, yeah, so you share one allele of one locus, but you don't share an allele of another locus, then you have a delayed rejection reaction. And here, ALR2 is not, uh, sorry, ALR1 is not shared between these colonies. And this is the sort of delayed rejection reaction you'll see. This one looks a lot like the, uh, the slime mold, even though it's a Nidarian, it's an animal, totally independently evolved. And this, this gene is also highly variable. This species of uh, hydroid lives on hermit crab shells and they form these uh, they'll form boundaries if there's another colony on the same shell. Um, this was uh, at a lighthouse point, Connecticut. They found 180 alleles of ALR2 in 239 colonies. And you can see in the foreground here some uh, distant uh, descendants of the vitrillids uh, <laughs> on this rocky outcropping here. <laughs> okay, so this. Uh, I'm just going to use Petrillus to think about association preference in uh, an evolutionary model. 
Okay, the way I'm looking at it is fusion creates a context for the interaction within the organism. So when you fuse, you fuse your blood vessels, now you can have conflict over somatic resources or germline positions. Then if you reject, then you avoid fusion. So fusion rejection is this similar to association preference. It is a form of association preference in my book. And then if you fuse with a non-relative, uh, what typically happens is you have a, like a, like the fungi, you have like a shrinkage or a death or something called resorption where one colony kind of kills the other one and takes it over like you saw in the slime mold. Uh, but that's usually involved with an overall kind of cost of growth. So my model, uh, which differs from, I call it an association theory model. And what it makes association theory different than kin selection theory or inclusive fitness theory is that it particularly distinguishes uh, how you treat another versus whether you associate. And then it allows in a model of recognition systems different cues and different sorts of behaviors. So it allows a more complex, uh, gradual model. And so my model, the steps were that I identified uh, indiscriminate fusion. So at the first place, you, uh, you evolve the fuse. This leads to the evolution of discriminatory conflict over uh, resource uh, with somatic resources or germline positions. Uh, when that's fixed, it causes you know, everybody's conflicting and fighting with each other, so it causes problems if you fuse with a non relative. And then the first kind of discrimination of, to evolve in, the, in response to that is association preference based on the, the cue you're using for conflict. So you start fighting, and then you avoid based on whether whatever caused you to fight. Well, the problem is in these organisms, usually you have to fuse your blood vessels to begin that sort of fighting. So you're already in the fight once you decide to uh, cut it off. So ideally you would discriminate based on something else that you can detect when you first start fusing. And so uh, that's this final uh, spot where you change the sort of cue you use to be on the outer uh, edge of the tunic. What my model showed is that if you use this other sort of cue, so you use a totally different gene for the detection, that is what allows you to evolve a highly diverse uh, cue that allows you to recognize kin. So that's where you get adaptive kin recognition. And that's just like a kind of an overview of a model. It is a game theory model at several steps. Uh, support for this came from the gradual evolution of these systems and uh, the phylogenetics of it. The, the main prediction is, is this, that you have to have this separate cue uh, in the petrillids or marine invertebrates, it's like the blood-borne factor versus what you first detect when you first uh, contact. But in general, for kin recognition to evolve, you need to have separate cues for how, you treat, how you're treating people or other individuals versus whether you associate. So again, the cues in ascidians are uh, these different, uh, whether it's in the blood or on an outer tunic, And I'll just, so there's evidence for this from fungi where you basically have a bunch of genes involved with what happens after you fuse, which are called heterocarion compatibility genes. And then there are some genes that determine whether you, you fuse at all in the first place, and they're called mycelial compatibility genes. And the, the focus is just now turning to mycelial compatibility. You see the same thing in the plasmagal slime molds where you have certain genes that control fusion at the first place and then different genes that determine what happens after you fuse. Uh, and even in Myxococcus bacteria, there is a, a gene that determines whether they fuse the outer cell membrane and then there's a separate gene that determines whether they have conflict after they fuse. And actually these are the first authors to, uh, to present the same idea which had never been in the literature before my paper and they gave it in their paper without citing mine, but that's all right. I can reference their idea, but there's actually problems in Myxococcus. Uh, it's kind of like Dictyostelium, and there's some details about how this model applies to organisms that are 
not sexually reproducing, which severely restricts how much polymorphism you can get. And so, uh, anyways, yeah, so dictyostelium, it's also possible here that you have separate genes controlling segregation, and then what happens after you form a chimera with a non-relative. And there is evidence similarly of conflict. In this case, the uh, chimeric slugs don't migrate as far and the breeding bodies fall over, whereas the clonal slugs uh, seem to do pretty well. But there are some intricacies of this as there is with the Mixococcus, uh, again, which I think comes from uh, partly being non-sexually reproducing and then partly there's some just details in the system that make it a little bit complicated, but I won't get into that. But I will show you a little video of segregation that I took. This is a wild clone and a uh, laboratory clone. So that just shows, the, and you do see this among wild clones sometimes, where they just totally segregate out. So in, in uh, brained organisms, this idea of having separate cues applies where you have a spatial cue for treatment, so here brood rating is a spatial cue, and then a separate cue for association preference, here being the messmate discrimination. So just to review, in brainless organisms, sometimes the same cues are used, in which case kin recognition itself would be adaptive, and um, I, th I think that might be true for sea anemones, although we don't know the cues used there. Uh, it also might be true at one level in Vitrillus, which is that it uses VHF for uh, discriminatory lar larval settlement, and it's also used for over overgrowth conflict. So at one level, that cue is used for both discriminatory harm and association preference. But it might originally evolve at this other level. So at the level of histocompatibility itself, there's a separate there are separate genes that determine within organism conflict and that fulfills the criteria for this to evolve adaptively. And plasmodial slime molds have these separate genes, and ascomycete fungi and dictyostelium. So the same model might apply to a lot of these organisms that use genetic uh, mechanisms for, uh, genetic cues for treatment. Okay, so brained organisms. A lot of vertebrates that form aggregations, fish, rodents, primates, often use MHC for both differential treatment and association preference. So in those cases, the kin recognition ability itself, in terms of the cue, isn't evolving adaptively probably for that purpose. Uh, but my model does yield insights even in those cases because it explains the selective pressure for association preference, which is to avoid conflict with non-relatives, which is different than the selective pressure of uh, nepotism. It's a, it's a, it sounds a little bit similar, but it's, it's saying it's a kind of additional evolutionary stuff. And then there are some potential adaptive uh, abilities in vertebrates, so definitely where the spatial cues are used, so kin nesting arthropods, most hymenopterans, isopods, kin nesting vertebrates, possibly mole rats. Uh, you know, spatial cues, which means any genetic cue used for association preference could evolve adaptively. And then there are some cases where maybe genetic cues are used for differential treatment where you could get a separate cue being used for association preference. I think wolves might be a case uh, where they're using distinctive, uh, you know, smell for conflict and then some auditory cue for association preference, like the howling. Okay. So just to review the, the differences, brainless organisms, they're usually sedentary, so then they have to use genetic cues for all of their discriminatory behaviors, whereas brain organisms are often highly mobile, and they can use all sorts of cues, including spatial and environmental cues. And what this means is that for brainless organisms, they're all, often gonna have these, uh, they're gonna switch cues evolutionarily, like the Petrilla decidians, going from the bloodborne to the outer cue, and then genetic kin recognition evolves adaptively after the cue switching. In the brain organisms, the cue switching is uncommon, 
but you still have genetic kin recognition uh, evolving adaptively where spatial cues used for differential treatment. So those hymenopterans and a lot of arthropods. And thank you. Um, uh, you can, I've, I've got a podcast and if y'all want to check that out, it's called the Natural Reward Podcast. And I'd be happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Why don't you see first if people on Zoom have questions? I see that Phil does. Bill, why don't you unmute yourself? Can you hear him? Uh, I heard. Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm sorry, I couldn't. The mic kicked up here. No, go ahead. Just go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it just depends on whether you're talking about a, a central processing unit with a nervous system where you're, you're sending all the information back to the central processing unit, which is the brain, or if all the cells in the body can do the same thing and it's more decentralized, or at least it's not requiring like feedback from a you know some central unit to the you know slime molds or fungi or these various marine invertebrates, it's just the cells on the outer edge are making the decisions by themselves without consulting with the you know, central authority sort of thing. <laughs> so I wouldn't, yeah, I would say it's a little different than standard uh, brain-based cognition. Although we, if you're gonna talk about intelligence, you know, it shows that you can be intelligent without having you, know, you can be intelligent without having a brain, right? And you can also be the opposite, like Darwin, you know, marrying his cousin probably wasn't the smartest decision. You know, he probably overthought it a little bit. But they did have like what nine or ten or any kids. They did, but like three of them died, or you know, his favorite daughter died pretty young. Yeah, it was pretty tough. And then he did these experiments on the on plants where he's growing the plants and, grow and breeding them either with uh, themselves or, or you know, outcrossing it. And he just saw the, over and over, he saw that if it was, he's selfing the plant, then the offspring are like smaller and spindlier and have problems and stuff. But um, he also found in one of his lines that there was like, after a number of generations of inbreeding, there was one that he called Hero, it was like this, huge plant that was bigger than even the outcrossed ones. And it, it, uh, it kind of reminded me of DFL when my dad had this inbred deer herd in there. There was this huge monster buck that came out of inbreeding uh, at some point. So you can kind of purge. Uh, it's like deleterious in the short term to expose the recessives, but then if it purges them, then you're left with something that might be even better. So, yeah, but you got to get through that initial stage. Oh, I have a question going back to the very beginning. Um, so, you know, when we talk of when 
talk about degrees of relatedness, uh, you pointed out the possibility of, uh, sh of sharing alleles at a, at a certain locus. And those ideas all came about, when well, no, those ideas came about in the 60s and 70s. The, the thought was that all mitochondria did was supply energy to the cell, right? But now we know that mitochondrial genes can perform lots of very important functions. And since it's always inherited through the maternal line, does that complicate, um, not for the animals, but for the theoreticians, how we, how we should calculate individual relatedness? Yeah, I mean, there, there are other complications between uh, epigenetic imprinting or a differential, you know, sex chromosome inheritance. So in my models, I ignore all that stuff because in my view, the basics of social evolution, people are talking about all these details and they haven't even worked out the basic difference between what, how you treat somebody and whether you associate and why you recognize kin and all the real basic stuff I haven't even been done yet. And you can think about that stuff, just thinking about simple models of autosomes and sexual population. And, uh, there are so many question, basic questions that are still unanswered that uh, yeah, people are doing that stuff, but I'm not like too into it just because I'm you know, working on this stuff. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you, you can get it real quick into some different I'd also say that when you're thinking about that, then you, you're going to be thinking of more like single gene or particular focus. And um, I think that focus, like people took it originally because they were they were employing like the selfish gene view of evolution and the how far can you get by assuming something that might be complicated is simple. And so people started defining relatedness in terms of a single gene. But then all of a sudden you lose track of that relatedness actually applies across the genome and can have big impacts on a complex behavior. And I wouldn't even, you know, you, there's just been a lot of, there, there's been a lot of, I mean, problems that have come from looking at it from a single gene perspective. But I won't get into all the issues there. But I would say just one. One is that people made overly simplistic models of kin recognition where they're just assuming one behavior and one cue. Instead of allowing for these different sorts of behaviors and multiple cues in a gradual process. And so if you're, if you're trying to model this with just one behavior and one cue, number one, you can't possibly get a solution to the problem of explaining hundreds of alleles ever. There's no way to do it. Then two, you might get some model that lets you get like 10 to 15 alleles, but then you have to assume that their the genes are linked and they're co-evolving. And people have done those models like a hundred times, like over and over and over, with increasing complexity, and it never changes the basic conclusion. And I've talked to people before, and I'm just like, why are you doing the same thing again? And uh, well, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is that it's more complicated and it's gradual and you have to go through different steps. But well, if that's the way evolution is, I don't want to study it again. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's the way it is. It's complicated. You know, you can't just. Uh, so why in, the, in, in developing this, this uh, argument, I was curious as to why you didn't start explaining or start with green beard as a simple allele idea and how that breaks down if you, when you move to a more genomic issue. Well, I mean, I, uh, I showed this figure where, uh, Why is relatedness important? 
and from a single gene perspective, and then there's this one. So I'm this, saying, yeah, if, if, if you, so a lot of people are familiar with the green beard, the, the name green beard, and it just seemed like if that were brought in here, that would connect that. Yeah, so I said green beard here. Okay. And what that does is it gives you similarity of one locus, and then it rapidly decays on either side. Now, I'm comparing that to a situation where you have actual relatedness, which gives you similarity across the entire genome and all the genes, right? It's like, okay, if there's that, then there's, well, relate, you almost get relatedness for free because if you descend from an, an individual and you're just in a local area, you're getting all of the genome similarity just by having reproduced and not moved anywhere. And uh, so you're getting a lot for free, basically. And then the real problem with green beard genes is not necessarily that it's uh, just one locus, although that's part of it. There's also a problem that, that it's easily cheated. There's just something called a false beard. So you got the green beard, but there's nothing that prevents the person that has the green beard but doesn't reciprocate in the area that totally is not, never altruistic from, uh, from coming in and cheating that system. And, and one thing that relatedness does is that it ensures that you inherit your green beard gene from the recent common ancestor who also has the behavior. Whereas if it's among non-relatives, well, your non-relatives could cheat it by just being a false beard. So, but then if you're gonna have to have relatedness anyways, what's the use of the whole green beard thing? You don't even need it. And you, you would have but the, the, the key there is just limiting your associations and interactions to, to your relatives. And that depends on variable cues, not on non-variable green beard genes. But people love the word green beard, so they constantly use it to refer to all this stuff. But the real concept of a green beard, which is that you have an altruistic, you, know, you have this one gene that does perception, uh, has a cue, has that action, which was altruism. That idea that you have one gene do all that stuff, people have acted like it's been shown, but it's actually never been shown because they're usually a, a confusing altruism and association. So like slime molds or something like social media, they, they said, oh, well, it's a green beer gene, CSA, but CSA just gets you into the aggregate. It's not the actual thing that determines the stock. Um, I mean, they've, they've called these different uh, invertebrate histocompatibility systems green beer genes, but that makes no sense because number one, they're involved with association, not altruism. And then they're highly variable. They restrict associations to relatives and not just non-relatives sharing the one gene. So yeah, it's theoretically it can't work and there's no evidence that it's ever happened. So the only thing that's similar that's happened that there's evidence for is spite, which is uh, something that it can evolve, evolve like as a toxin antidote system. You see this in bacteria, where the plasmid codes for these three things. It gives you the toxin and the antidote. So it's kind of like the cue, the perception, the action. And that's the closest thing to a real green beer gene that's like in nature. And, um, Owen, oh, could you go to the slides that you have? I think there's three of them where you have the locus and the alleles, and it shows um, which choose to fuse and which don't fuse. My, my question on those is the ones that have, yes, so the ones that are fusing, is there, do they have an upper hand when they have more similarity? versus the one that figure C, where it's just one locus is the same and it still fuses versus figure B. Is figure B stronger and have an upper hand? Is there hierarchy in this? Yeah, so this is one of these interesting questions. So Vitrilis works the same way, which is that 
instead of having two uh, two loci there, it's it's just VHF. But it also it's it's kind of similar in the sense that you only have to share one allele to fuse. And what that what the consequence of that is is that individuals can can fuse with sexually produced kin and their parents. Whereas if you had a system where you have to share both alleles of the diploid locus, it would often prevent you from fusing with with uh, siblings or parents. And so one question is, so to answer your question, no, I don't think it, um, if you're talking about a, a given level of relatedness, so you're talking about uh, fairing, uh, fusing with a sibling that shares both, uh, both the wheels at each locus versus one that only has one wheel at each locus, I don't think it matters because all that does is it tells you that you're, you're fusing. As long as you're fusing with the same class of relative, I think it's, it's going to have the same consequence on average. Um, there is a question there, you know, is the allele sharing system versus genotype uh, hold, you know, we have to share both, is that some kind of adaptive uh, shift that happened in order to allow fusion with relatives uh, close kin, not just clone mate. And I've thought about this, and I, I think that uh, it would it would more easily that sort of behavior would more easily evolve, evolve once you already have a kin recognition system that limits you to clone mates, because there's less of a cost to it. If you already have a variable locus, then there's not as much of a cost to kind of making it more accepting because you're already able to reject non-relatives. But in order for this to evolve in the first place, it'd be very difficult because you would often be fusing with non-relatives. And that would have a big uh, detrimental impact on, you know, if you, know, if you're, if you have the system where you're fusing with uh, ones that share only one allele, you're often gonna be fusing with non-relatives. <coughs> and that's gonna, Keep that from evolving. But nobody's modeled that kind of question yet, although it's also relevant to vertebrates and it, it would require a little bit different of a game theory model where you allow these different classes of relatives, each one has a different probability of sharing these different genes. Um, but that's a that's kind of a detail. You can get like these these basic ideas about differential treatment and association preference come just from a model of, of clan mates and, and non -clan. Do you have any optimism that people who worked on brain organisms will pay, pay any attention to this this area? I mean I think it's uh, kin recognition is a big area of research now, and it's it's really like exploding. And I think that pe eventually people will figure that you know they will get around. And people will start uh, using these ideas. But this shows you right here, this graph, like how much people are studying kin recognition compared to altruism, and it's about the same right now. And it's really like the, uh, it's a hotter topic. I mean, you see it in plants and bacteria, uh, humans, uh, and people are now trying to get more into the neurobiology of it. I just saw some recent papers come out on that. And it's, it's a pretty, yeah, I mean, it's just exploding, but all, the, all these papers, they still cite Hamilton and wrong ideas about why it evolves. So eventually people are gonna read my paper, I think. <laughs> I think you have another note in the chat. Well, we better wrap this up. I gotta get back to another Zoom meeting. Well, thanks a lot, I'm just a good way to uh, end the semester with some pretty serious theoretical concepts to think about. Could you um, end the meeting for everybody? Maybe it is. Yeah, hit A.